last meeting. Here we go. Okay, so what we've got today is we've got three presentations and then we are functionally done. So let me kind of give you an idea very quickly of what I do when I go back and look at the grades. Um, I, I'm not sure yet. I'd have to look and look at my notes, but without looking at my notes, I think I think in one way or another, I have heard from everyone who needs to make up an assignment and we've made some sort of arrangement. If that's not the case, uh, and I won't know for sure until, I just don't want to move any more things around on either screen. It's distracting. But if that's not the case, then um, it's, remember, it's your responsibility to let me know if for some reason you didn't complete an assignment, you know, we've got to negotiate an amnesty where I can still allow you to attempt the assignment. I'll remind you one more time that um, the syllabus is clear and I've made clear in class that in order to pass the course, the letter of the law is you have at least to attempt every assignment, okay? So what I'm gonna do, just so this makes sense, because it's a little bit unusual maybe by the standards of some of your other faculty. When I'm doing this, what I do is I, I, I look at the two um, presentation grades that you had and those are a score out of 25. And then I look at the two written assignments. Those are a score out of 25. Obviously, 100 points possible. And then what I do, assuming that you've attempted that you show a grade, right, for every assignment, I remove your lowest grade, okay? And then I average the assignments. So some of you had a situation where you did really solidly on, on most of your work, but maybe you had a bad day or you, there were some readings that didn't make sense or whatever and your presentation was less good. One assignment won't break your grade, okay? Um, because my, I, my sense of this in terms of how people learn is that everyone has a flat spot during the term, especially in winter term, where everyone seems to kind of hit the wall at, at different points. I just don't want you to worry about that. I am trying to give you the benefit of the doubt in the way that I evaluate grades. And then uh, in order to refine how I weigh your total grade, I look at whether or not you completed all the, all the note assignments that, that were given, right? And um, I have some notes on in-class participation. If people asked, you might notice every once in a while, I'll kill my sound and I'll type real fast. And sometimes I'm sorry, I forget to kill the sound. I'm making a note because somebody in class raised a really important point or something. I refer back to those things when I'm, when I'm averaging out your grades. And again, the idea is I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. If it looks like you've learned, that's good. If it doesn't look like you applied yourself or anything like that, well, then you'll just get sort of a straight grade and I won't worry much about it. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning that to you is that it does take me a while to grade and because I'm doing all these little things and I've got these little nuance mechanisms built in to try to allow for the variations in the inevitable walls that we hit, even if it's only for a couple hours or a couple of days in the midst of a term. We all have that happen. I have it happen where it's just, you're not quite feeling it, you know? So it takes me a while to do that. As a consequence of that, it's really important. I mean, really important that on this last assignment, please don't turn it in late, okay? Because then I can start doing preliminary grading right away, okay? And then I can let the grade sit for a while and I can go back and do all those other norming mechanisms that I have when I have more time. Does that make sense? I'm just asking you on this one in particular uh, to really try and make the deadline because then I can spend more time kind of, for want of a better term, smoothing these grades, you know? And, and things like that. And so, um, as I say, we've got three presentations today. If you have um, any final questions on any of the readings or anything or anything else about course materials and stuff like that, you can ask those questions. Other than that, I cut you loose. Um, next week is finals week. Um, you have until Thursday of next week to turn in the last assignment. So you see how this is working. That gives me Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to grade which normally would be a lot of time, but I also have political science 498, which is the senior seminar. And those papers are complex, they're built in stages, and there's a tremendous amount of stuff to evaluate and, and average together in those assignments, okay? Those take a long time too. So just please do me the favor of do, making your best effort to turn in that last assignment 
if you can turn it in early and you feel comfortable about it, that's great, but at least have it in by 11 o'clock um, on Thursday of finals week, which I want to say is the 18th. Um, let, me, let me just bear, I hate that when I give wrong dates. Let me verify that. Yes, it's Thursday the 18th. And um, that'll, be, that'll be the last, uh, the last deadline for you in this class. Now, before we do the presentations, uh, does anybody have any, any procedural questions or any, any of that kind of, you know, how do I know what my grade's going to be stuff? Um, all the I, had a, I had a quick question about just the, um, the module essay. So um, is that going to, is, are we supposed to be comparing that to all of the modules, like the past modules, kind of, um, you know, how you were talking about, they all are, it's not new media, that kind of thing. Um, or is it just kind of comparing the articles for within this module? Well, I don't know if you had a chance yet to look at the prompt because I made it visible, I want to say yesterday. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I haven't seen it. No, that that's yet. okay. I'm saying you may very well then not have had a chance to look at it again. But that'll give you preliminary guidelines. In other words, at the very least, here's what I'd like you to do. I think I mentioned before, and it's a perfectly good question. I'll mention it again. If you are able and you feel comfortable enough taking, you know, let's say any two of these readings, right, or more, and yeah. somehow tying them into earlier modules, you know, uh, earlier ideas, earlier things, things like that, you, you know, that's going to, if you do it effectively, that's really right. going to be great, sure, because it's going to show that, you know what, I'm not just focusing on this module, but I kind of see now how the course fits together. Okay, but, yeah, that okay. makes sense. That's that, what I was okay. doing. Yeah, good. Um, sorry, did I hear someone else or was that just, okay, I think it was just somebody not muted. Okay, that's all right. All right, uh, anything else? I think everyone who's going to show up is here. All right, so let's see. We left off with the um, the discussion. Yeah, Bennett's here. Okay, good. With the discussion of Facebook. Obviously, Facebook's been in the news a lot, particularly over the last year, but more particularly over the last four years of the, of the Trump presidency. And you know, both Twitter and Facebook as sort of key social media, particularly for oddly enough, an older demographic, you know, tw how many of you, I mean, you can't really do this because you've all got your cameras off, but um, maybe use your raised hand icon or whatever. How many of you actually still use Twitter? You do. Yeah, I'm a little surprised because it's kind of a dead medium for most people your age. Um, you've gone to other things. For a while, it was Instagram. Um, but I, I wonder, you know, I mean, the thing about Twitter is that the heavier usage right now, it's kind of what happened to Facebook. Facebook used to be your generation. Now it's my generation. It's like people keeping track of their kids and, you know, hitting on old ex-boyfriends or girlfriends from high school days and stuff, real creepy stuff that old people do, you know. But it's, I mean, that's become Facebook. It's sort of, remember, you won't remember, will you? Most of you don't remember MySpace. The same thing happened with MySpace. Um and it was it was absolutely pathetic. Um, Facebook is now MySpace in a sense. Um, it's it's how many, oh there's one. How many of you really routinely regularly use Facebook? Yeah, see that doesn't surprise me. I think Facebook is pretty much dead. Good, well done by the way. Nice. I'm glad. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear it. And and not only that, but your moms and dads will have no idea what you're up to now because they're they are now on Facebook. They've elbowed you aside and taken it over. Okay. The point of this is, um, and this is this brings to mind um, the question that we just addressed with that that Valeria brought up with um, tying things together. I think I pointed out early on, you know, this idea of new media is not a new idea. The technology is original to a generation, let's say. There are generational technologies. Digital technology is generational transformative technology in a way that fossil fuel technology or steam technology were transformative generational technologies that beyond which the world was substantially different, okay? Um, but the same sort of phenomena I think you're starting to see kind of accrued to these various media. When people first started using the telegraph to transmit information, the immediacy of that was really stunning to people. When the telephone was first invented, 
uh, when, you know, photography is a, me a reproductive medium, an archival medium, was perfected. It just changed the whole landscape. There was a whole controversy um, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century on whether or not photographs could be art because they weren't drawn or painted and things like that. And, and a lot of artists really hated photography because they thought that it was sort of cheating, you know, when, uh, you know, so when these new technologies come along, they often are, are significant to a generation beyond which people begin to live somewhat differently, okay? For this module, it's been essentially the application of digital technology, even while using, we still use a print medium, it's just virtual. You still have to read Epic Times or, you know, things like that. Um, but it's presented to you in a different way. And there's often a sense of immediacy. There's often a sense of it being more personal. We've seen that uh, when we were talking about the softening of journalistic political communication, one of the things that kept coming up was personalization. You know, that becomes very important. And that is characteristic of your generation. It's, it's a kind of post-adolescent view of communication that everything must be personal and emotional. Um, and that sounds condescending when I say post-adolescent. I actually mean that in a developmental sense. I mean, we, we do go through these kind of life phases where it takes us a while to kind of get out of the way of ourselves. Um, and mo for most of us, that really probably doesn't happen until about your middle 30s, somewhere in the early to middle 30s, where you finally start realizing for a variety of reasons, gee, there are other people on this planet and they also have needs and they also have problems. And, you know, I should probably, ex in more than just the abstract of save the whales or save the whatever, maybe I should start listening to these people. You know, maybe my parents, while they certainly were idiots, maybe I should be more attentive to what's going on inside their heads. Maybe I can be of use to them. And I don't think that occurs to most people in their teens and 20s. By your 30s, it does. It's that idea of you sort of, you know, in a way, you're getting some, some personal distance from the things around you. You don't take everything as personally. But what a lot of these media do is they repersonalize things very intensely, if virtually, very intensely. Okay. So having said that, with that benediction in mind, um, shall we talk a little bit about Facebook and misleading political ads? Um, yeah, so thanks for that intro. And then, so this article was written by a CNN tech reporter named Brian Fung, who also worked for the Washington Post for technology and the athletic, the Atlantic. Um, so the article makes the point right from the beginning that Facebook allowed these ads to be spread and essentially didn't follow their own policy of containing claims, which are debunked by third party fact checkers. So he makes that point off the bat and then goes into uh, defending Biden and the US Postal Service, which were the main targets of the ads. So these ads were all created by super PACs, which super PACs are independent political committees that are able to receive unlimited contributions from individuals, corporations, or labor unions. And with those finances, they're able to put them into either political parties or different political uh, unions or political activities. So an activist group called Avaz was the main group that looked into the um, the Facebook transparency ads and found that the data, there was over 10 million views on one of these super PACs called America First Action, which spent over $300,000 on almost 500 ads containing false information on Biden's tax plan proposal as well as his immigration policies. So much of what they were trying to do was push out false narratives and spread them throughout communities, um, specifically communities that were like in within swing states right before the election to possibly sway those swing states. And then so I think the important 
part of this article and like you were speaking about with new technology is the algorithms in Facebook were actually one of the leading reasons that these articles were being spread so, so quickly. It was reported that they were actually being spread six times faster than real news stories. And this can be both because like they're catchier titles or they like the, the like claims that you see on them like jump out at you. Like the, some of the most viewed fake ads would say like claim one of them was Nancy Pelosi stole from the social securities and used it to cover up like costs for the impeachment trials was one of those that got spread the most. Another one, a lot of them are about like different uh, politicians being immigrants and working with like either terrorist organizations or different political entities to overthrow the US government. But so essentially the algorithm can't depict since it's technology, it doesn't know what truth is. So when it sees something and sees multiple people clicking on it, responding to it or liking it, it automatically takes this and puts it out to more people without knowledge of whether it's spreading something true or not. So it's, it's taking the articles that people stare at the longest because you see Nancy Pelosi is stealing from our country and using it to cover up her own expenses or for her own gain. You're going to look at that article much longer than you would scrolling through to see a CNN post like, like this one that talks about misleading ads that doesn't catch your, it doesn't catch your attention as much as someone stealing or trying to overthrow their country. And I thought a lot about the movie, The Social Dilemma. All right, I'm muted. I'm a fool today. Um, I, I was, by the way, I was in a four hour Zoom meeting with directors and chairs today. So if I'm a little zombie like today, I'm going to apologize in advance, but this is the last time I'm going to apologize. I hate the world right now, but not Bennett because he did a hell of a job. Um, let me, before you go any further, um, you gave us a lot to chew on there. Uh, Bennett, and, and that was quite well done. Um, do, do, I want to I want to hear kind of responses if there are any to that, either questions or comments on that, because I've got a few things to add to that. But yeah, Renee, do you have your hand? Yeah, you do have your hand up. I was just wondering. Um, you're talking about these ads, and the titles are kind of familiar. I don't know if anyone remembers right before the election, but there were YouTube ads. Uh, that Donald Trump would put out that had like all the are these the same ones that you're talking about or are these like completely different because it sounds like kind of the same thing. Are you asking me? Because uh, in fairness, the reading. article doesn't refer to those, so Bennett might not know. Oh, okay. What what they are? Most of them were put out by this and another political action committee, but a lot of them came from you know America First Action, and they're the same content. Right, and with obviously the same end in sight, which is um, misinformation, mm -hmm. dis disinformation, in fact. In other words, these the important distinction here is these are not mistakes. These are deliberate distortions and falsehoods. Now, again, there was a, there was a, a sort of pro-Democrat um, organization that also was among one of the more egregious offenders, which is not surprising in an election year, right? But it was, by, by comparison, it didn't quite really keep up. And it begs the question, and it's a fair question, given everything that, that Bennett shared with us, and looking at that as a kind of template of political communication right now, how much of the current leadership disposition in the Republican Party, is, I don't want to say is anti-democratic, but is, let's say, counter-democratic, that is, we don't want people to be well-informed because well-informed people are critical. Well-informed people ask questions and well-informed people uh, can't be led very easily. There might be a significant distinction right now in between the leadership of the two parties, not so much in terms of policy, that's always hard to read, but in terms of whatever commitment they might have to sort of maximizing participation. 
a lot of negative advertising, a lot of negative messaging, uh, studies have shown the kinds of things that, that, that Bennett described, you know, over the course of the last several decades, there are a couple of really consistent effects that tend to be measured. One of them is people remember negative things, okay, especially if they are alarming. And as Bennett pointed out, someone says that, oh, Nancy Pelosi isn't just maybe doing something you might disagree with in a principled way because she's a Republican, she's a Democrat. She's attacking her country. She's undermining her country. She's doing illegal things. She's a crook that you're going to remember that. But also, it tends to increase cynicism. And cynicism often leads to disengagement, OK? The more cynical you are about things, the less likely you are to see them as of significant importance that you should participate. And so there's a, a real argument to be had here as to whether or not the deliberate strategy of this current Republican leadership, I don't mean rank and file Republicans in the electorate who are not a party to this at all, but the leadership, the structural leadership of the party has accepted that this is a way for a minority party to continue to try to meaningfully contest elections by suppressing voter turnout in, by the way, a perfectly legal way. Yes, they're lying. And a lot of their, the things they're claiming are absolutely absurd. In fact, one of the arguments to defend these has been from some, some, from some Republicans, these things are so obviously absurd, no one would believe them. But we know that's not true, but it's a brilliant argument because they do seem absurd. You remember when we were talking about QAnon, a lot of those things seem absolutely ridiculous. But if you've had a steady stream of exposure to negative messaging, most of it targeting one party as opposed to another, you might just by default accept, well, yeah, it, maybe that's not what it is, but it's probably just as bad. Those people are trying to overthrow the government and they, I disagree with them. The but the problem is it might lead to, I'm not even gonna vote. So it might be a strategy that blows up in the Republicans face. Yeah, Monica. Your comment on the uh, well-informed public being difficult to control. I was thinking that my understanding of this misinformation campaign was that it was to make the masses feel, or the, those people who bought into this um, campaign, make them feel like they were informed while not actually being informed. It, that's still an uninformed public, correct? Even though exactly. they're informed. Exactly. Because yeah. remember, disinformation isn't information. When, when something is completely factually invalid, that's not information. It's just noise. And if you give people noise that feels like they're, they've learned something, or re more importantly, I think what you're suggesting, Monica, reinforces what they're already predisposed to want to believe, which in this case would be Democrats are a bunch of pit vipers and idiots and horrible people, and they, you know, they, they don't go to church and they don't pay their taxes and they're all crooks. And then someone comes along and says, Nancy Pelosi is a crook. You just, yeah, you tick the box, you put that in the Democrats are crook drawer of your brain, and you feel like it reinforces something you already, in air quotes, know, even though you know nothing. Okay. If you were informed, those, uh, like somebody like me who's always seeing this stuff and who, as part of what I've done working with other scholars, has analyzed these ads, that's not going to have any effect on me at all, except, you know, to annoy me a little bit the way a mosquito does. Um, but for someone else, that mosquito might give him political malaria. It might make him really sick in terms of really, you know, making them very, very feverish about how they feel about their own lives and how they feel about the system and how they feel about the opposition. They might see them in, in a kind of hallucinogenic way because they're not seeing anything very clearly. I kind of like that malaria metaphor. Have any of you ever had malaria? Because I did. Um, you, you really have missed out, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating way to be ill, and, it, and it, it's the gift that keeps on giving for anywhere from three to five years. But anyway, it is that thing where you're, you're ill, you're slightly, it's like you're feverish, that, you know, every new stimulus upsets you, every new stimulus brings on that ague and, and, and you know, the fever and everything that you associate with a kind of illness of, of disinformation, okay? So Monica, yeah, you know, it's the illusion of information. That's a very good point that I hope people think about if you want to write about the Facebook piece is this provides people with what the French deconstructionists called a simulacrum, in this case, a simulacrum of political knowledge. It seems like I know something and so it will suffice. 
you know, it will fill that gap for me. Okay. That's a, I mean, Baudrillard were alive being French. He would hate me, but that's okay. Cause you know, he's not alive and I am, I don't think he is anyway. It's like, it feels like, you know, something, but when stopped and questioned, you realize you don't, if you're never stopped and questioned, if you never face opposing information, or if when you do face it, it's immediately negated by the constant barrage of, barrage of disinformation you're receiving, you're going to go with the stuff that you feel more comfortable with. You being anybody, by the way, particularly though, the less you know, the higher your level of ignorance, the more easily manipulated you are. This goes for anybody, anywhere, anytime. You try going in and buying a car if you don't know anything about cars. You will be fed a line of crap. Yeah, Monica. Could the emotional um, inflammatory news surrounding Trump as well from the left be considered in the same category as misinformation? No, Even because it's, it's, not, not, it's not false. The problem is it's not false. That's the difference. Very little of the accusations against Donald Trump was false. Now, some of it was what I would refer to as hyperbolic. You know, people would say, like, you know, the, the analysts, let's say, whatever they want to call themselves on, you know, MSNBC might say, well, this is, you know, th this is a very, very serious crime and, and, and it's the worst since this or it's the worst since that. Well, those are very subjective opinions. Because they're subjective, they're not false. But at least in the, in the content analyses that I've looked at of MSNBC coverage in particular, they have very seldom been called out as being as being deliberately wrong or as reporting something that they knew better, okay? Fox News doesn't hold up as well to the same scrutiny. And, and part of that is that, you know, the demographic, the political demographics right now really do favor, if they favor anybody, they favor Democrats. Uh, but they're gonna, they're gonna uh, if we have time, I'll explain why they're gonna screw that up too. Um, you know, the Republicans, the core Republican constituency is, is white, it's less well-educated, it's aging. Um, and you know, it's, so it's the same as the Fox News demographic. You know, Fox News is losing eyeballs on screens, okay? Um, they're fighting for relevance because of that. And so, um, you, you know, in other words, if people were making stuff up about Trump and then circulating that, but, you know, the, the challenge would be, think of a significant accusation that was leveled against Trump that was, that was not even plausible or that was proven patently to be false. We can think of any number that were leveled against Barack Obama, that were leveled against Joe Biden, or that were leveled against Kamala Harris or any number of Democrats, but it's really hard to come up with these same kinds of disinformation tropes, which means deliberately deceiving people that came from other than the right and the Republicans. I'm not saying they don't. I'm saying the incidents of them are so much lower and arguably so much less effective that, um, you know, it, it, this is not, this is one of those things where it's not a both sides do it kind of thing. It's, this is not a balanced kind of thing. We have to be honest about that. Okay. It's not. And part of it is that Democrats have a different way of appealing to and rallying not only their supporters, but they understand, okay, we need to get back the independent voters because most of the independent voters are moderates. There's a real struggle going on within the Democratic Party right now, but it's not the one that you might be thinking about. Um, I'm going to do it very briefly. The most problematic constituency in the Democratic Party right now in terms of ideology, it's not women and it's not people of color. It's educated white people. Because the Democrats every election year have a higher percentage of university educated white liberal voters. Those are the people overwhelmingly who support defunding the or say they support defunding the police and a lot of the really radical reforms and movements toward socialism and things like that. Okay. It's not people of color. It's not Latin, it's not the Latinx voters. It's not the African American voters. Those ideas are not popular there. And that story is not often told. I think most people think that the Democrats have become a party of minority interests in, in an ethno-linguistic way. That's not true, okay? The Democrats are not about identity politics. The danger of the Democrats for moderates and, and conservatives is the volatile core of, of the Democratic Party is white, affluent, and educated, okay? 
and they are the ones most likely to have the most radical views. Um, now, that's not the, the, the narrative that you get very much on the news, okay? But it is why, despite a, 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 a latent demographic advantage, Democrats probably will not reachieve majority status within your lifetimes, unless the Republicans just catch fire and burn down, you know? And so the idea is, if you are, if there's a growing core within your party that has ideas that are well outside the mainstream, what do you do? You know, most of America is not evangelical or fundamentalist. Most of America is not culturally conservative. Most of America is ideologically moderate and tolerant, okay? We get a little tolerant as, as a society pretty much every year, okay? And so you can't, you can't build the Republican base from that predicate. That is, you can't just talk straight. If, if you can't win elections at all, without that really volatile, very sort of cultural reactionary base. If you lose them, if you use, you know, white blue collar workers with high school education or less, if you lose them as a political party and you are the Republicans, you are finished. You are done. You cease, you become the Whigs or something like that. So it's a real challenge for them. And so before you get all high and mighty about condemning the Republicans and saying, well, that's because they're evil people, they're desperate. They are, they are fighting a losing demographic battle, okay? They're fortunate in that they're fighting against an opponent who's not taking much advantage of, of the latent demographic advantage that Democrats have. You know, they, they, and also, Republicans have been much more effective at using these kinds of techniques in order to, um, to control state legislatures, which then, every census year, right, come out and rezone the districts to the advantage of whatever party controls the state, that, that's a procedure that's going to change. And also, they've been very good at, at kind of gaming the electoral map. You know, and, and I think it's in six of the last seven presidential elections, okay, the Democratic candidate has had, had more votes than the Republican, okay. But that's not the way we decide presidential elections. You know, that's where the disposition of the states comes in. So when Republicans do these things, they don't do them because they're, it, it, it's not about morally condemning people. You can look at them ethically and say, well, gee, this isn't very small d democratic because a democracy is at its most vibrant when the people are, are most well informed. Right. And that's also when people are the hardest to manipulate and the hardest to persuade. And both sides do this in different ways. But I think in terms of the isn't the stuff about Trump equally disinformation, no because almost all of it turns out to be true. Now, it doesn't mean, I mean, I would say that there were accusations made about other Republicans, George W. Bush, for example. You may, rem well, you were so young, most of you won't remember, but um, we'll move on in a second, but I think it's fair to consider this. When George W. Bush was president and was trying to go through the UN and persuade the UN to give the United States a resolution that would allow for us legally to invade a sovereign state, right, Iraq. OK, a lot of Democrats were very fast and loose calling George Bush a liar. What no one really did much to stop and think about was, wait a minute. Is he a liar? Is he knowingly deceiving people? Or is he getting bad intelligence? What we found out was he was getting lousy intelligence. Th that's, that would be one, Monica, like what you're referring to. People were attacking George W. Bush for something that was not fair. George W. Bush, there's very little evidence that he systematically lied while president of the United States. Okay. And that, so back during his presidency, it would have been the Democrats who were kind of fast and loose with the facts, I think. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else on Facebook? Does the, have, you, have you had a chance to read the article yet, most of you? I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward. It's only about five pages. It should make pretty good sense. What I want you to think about is the content's pretty easy to get at. Try and think about what does this mean? What does this tell us? That's what I was just now in a very long-winded way. I apologize. Trying to allow you to think about us. Well, what does this mean in the context of current American, you know, political partisanship and things like that? It can be decisive because neither political party is popular. Neither political party is anything near being a majority. And so they're both getting desperate, you know. All right, that was, that was um, quite interesting. Thank you, Bennett. Um, let's talk about social media as public journalism. This connects to the Facebook issue, but
but it builds on it in an, in, I think, in an interesting way. And this is Georgia and Dallas, and I believe you are both here. Yes. Okay. So who wants to start? The suspense is killing me. Watch, they're both gone. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought that we were doing this one next week. There is no next week. Next week is finals week. Okay, let's go. Somebody. Um, I can't remember who the author the author's name, but uh, basically what I got from the article is that it's kind of social media is now like a new form of like journalism and it's called like 2.0 journalism and it's opening up more doors for, you know, anyone can post what they want about like a protest or um, an event and also it can reach many different platforms like uh, the Native American pipeline uh, protest they live live streamed on Facebook and so from what I got from this article it kind of talked about how um, how mainstream media kind of focuses on uh, more violent images while uh, social media users kind of focus on like getting more content out there or information and um, sorry I'm just looking at my notes um, and I kind of asked a lot of, uh, my friends and from what I got from this article is that, uh, Gen Z, uh, particularly prefers social media as like a news outlet sort of, because, um, you know, you can have it anywhere you go. Cause you can just pull it up on your phone. Uh, you can post something right away and it can go viral or something. Um, and you don't have to go out of your way to buy a newspaper or turn on the TV because we like to be a little lazy sometimes. Um, but um, it was talking about how like mainstream media kind of focuses on like making a spectacle out of the violence uh, when uh, like a protest is going on, like they'll post images of like burning cars or, um, people hitting other people and um, looking and how uh, now like social media uh, users are trying to take control over the um, kind of take back control of the narrative um, and they're trying to counter mainstream media um, and uh, kind of from what I've noticed and the article brought up how, uh, you know, on social media, we continue to post, we continue to try to reach other people when with a story while like the news media will only maybe report on it for about a week. So we kind of keep the story going so no one forgets about it. Um, but a lot of uh, journalists disregard social media as a uh, news source because uh, you can't particularly verify it or base it all on facts. Um, and then it was getting into how uh, Facebook exploits its users and how uh, we're kind of considered prosumers. And uh, they exploit us and kind of turn us into a commodity of uh, just trying to shove ads down our face. Um, but what a lot of social media users have noticed is that um, it's sort of hard to post whatever you want on social media because of like censorship and stuff. And especially around the world, not every country has access to all of Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's go from there. Um, You've, you've made a couple of assertions here. One of them is that uh, if I understand you, sometimes it sounds like what you're saying is that social media creates these new platforms of kind of the, the sort of the term that's often used is prosumer journalism. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, you're not quite pros, you sort of yeah. get consumer professional 
semi-pro, uh, whatever. Um, and that somehow there's a, there's a difference in the way that, uh, let's call them sort of citizen observers, you know, cover events as opposed to a trained journalist. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, is there any, and I'm asking this of either one of you, um, is there any meaningful difference then between say, you say, well, journalists will sometimes disregard what they're seeing and so hearing in social media because they can't verify it. You know, they can't fact check it as, as readily perhaps, right? Um, the authors suggest a little bit different interpretation of that. They suggest that there can be a kind of interconnection between um, social media or public journalism and professional journalism, don't they? Mm -hmm. And either of yeah. you, or like maybe, I don't know, Dallas, you want to talk about that a little bit? Or, I mean, you know, what, what would be the connection between public journalism and professional journalism? Um, what I got from it was kind of that the connection would be like, obviously, they have the main verified sources, like one movement that they talked about was like the Black Lives Matter movement, where um, a lot of they say, like, a lot of the perspective is coming from like the police and politicians and stuff, while the social media aspect brings more of like the raw, like in the moment movement, where it's like showing like, um, live protests, and like, um, the events as they're unfolding and kind of keep it more in the public eye compared to like um, the news cycle, which just kind of keeps running on to the next story. And so, it, like I said, I wanted to keep it more in the public eye. That's a that's an important observation. Um, this notion of a news cycle is an institutional um, it's an institutional environment characterized by standard operating procedures. We have mentioned several times the shift to a twenty four hour news cycle because this has a lot to do with what Dallas is talking about. The challenge for professional journalism of a 24-hour news cycle is that if you're really going to fill 24 hours with breaking news, that is incredibly labor-intensive and capital-intensive. You have to have people on site all the time, always asking questions. You know, news never sleeps without either do the journalists, okay? Or you have to pull back get a fairly tight rotation of news stories and play those in cycle like an FM radio station throughout the day. That's become the, the, the as far as news is concerned, that's kind of become the business model. It's one of the reasons why journalism has given way to commentary because commentary isn't about breaking news, okay? The people who do commentary often don't know very much, okay? They might be specialists in a certain area. They might be trained in law or they might have once worked for a political party. They might be you know, very savvy about how to run a campaign, but they may not understand the way a trained journalist might, what's going on at any minute in time. They're drawing on their personal experience, their professional experience, and they're expressing points of view, opinions, okay? What you get with public journalism, and I think Dallas, tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm misreading you, you get a very raw, in the moment depiction of what's happening on the street. It is admittedly subjective, but it's raw and it's powerful and it's compelling. And Dallas, what you seem to suggest the authors are saying is that that can give a story legs, that can keep a story in the news cycle where without that coverage and the imperative of that emotional engagement and that, you know, that footage in the making and the knowledge that those cameras are always there, right? that story might die. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. It kind of draws the viewer in to where they're like putting in more time into the research and like the, then they can look more into like the mainstream articles that are covering the, uh, like the movements, like and the social media posts and videos that they saw regarding it to kind of, it gives them like the firsthand account, which makes them want to learn more about the whole like overview of the like overriding like politics and stuff behind it right that's great and the other thing about or another thing about that that's kind of important because news divisions are um really under much more fiscal financial pressure than they were say 50 years ago if, if you can get legal access to somebody's camera phone 
footage or something like that. It's dirt cheap. All you have to do is get them to sign a release. It's free. And yet you will have on the ground footage that you didn't have to send a professional, relatively well-paid crew out to go and capture. So that there are a lot of reasons, in other words, the authors suggest that the kind of things that Georgia and Dallas are talking about can have a kind of, they can have a kind of, of, of symbiosis. They can kind of interact, if not intentionally, ultimately, they can find points of connection. What are some of the limitations in this article? Um, and, you know, remember, the primary focus here is protest reporting. And with respect to, say, public journalism, you know, um, new media journalism, prosumer journalism, and protest, what are some of the limitations, at least one or two, that were kind of talked about in the article? Do you remember? Um, if you if you look at the article, I'll, I'll help you a little bit. If you look at the, the section called boundary conditions, that's kind of what I'm directing people to. And for those of you who haven't read the article yet, be sure that you read section five there on boundary conditions. Okay. It begins, um, while advancements in information transmission are potentially empowering for civil society prosumer activists, and again, prosumer, as Georgia pointed out, new communications media are subject to boundary conditions that are intention with emancipatory or empowering movement goals. That is, they can, they can sometimes um, uh, complicate the, the sort of empowering or democratizing movement influences and mobilization capacity of this kind of journalism. Why is that? What happens? Does that make sense what I'm, what I'm trying um, to explain? Can you repeat that? Well, I'm, I'm actually reading from the article, okay? While advancements in, I'm on, what page am I on? This is seven. While advancements in information transmission are potentially empowering for civil society prosumer activists, right? Because remember, the focus is on civil action, okay? New communications media are subject to boundary conditions that are in tension with emancipatory empowering movement goals. And that start first, broadly speaking, the mobilization potential of ICTs may be overstated. So that's the first most important thing. Um, there's been a lot of research. I've, been, I've got three or four books sitting over here on the shelf that are uh, informing me on this as well. There are a lot of limitations to the ability to mobilize people using an online presence. It isn't the same thing as having people, you know, retweeting something or, you know, passing on something they saw on Facebook. When you're trying to get a social movement going, and maintain it, sooner or later, people have to get out on the streets. People have to spend money. They have to put themselves out there. They have to make a commitment to something. And what the authors are suggesting here is they're, they're invoking research. The uh, Margaret Hale and, and John, um, th those studies suggest, you know what? It isn't any easier now to mobilize people than it ever was. And they, they talk about Things like Arab Spring, which clearly had a digital prosumer component to it, as not being typical, but being outside the norm, that that was unusual, that that was as successful as it is. And also, you'd be more aware probably of the Hong Kong protests. Those had a very strong, um, you know, public journalism component to them. Okay. And because one of the things that they did was they reminded the Hong Kong police hey, we're watching you. And the stuff that we're, that we're, that's on this camera, it's going to show up in an American network because we're going to give it to them, okay? But that, that that's not typical. It's not easy to do, and it's not typical, okay? So it's a limitation. Yeah, Brett, did you, I'm sorry, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I was just, just the, the term activist journalism to me doesn't, I don't know, I, can you really be both? That's one of the I'm other- I'm sorry, excuse me, did I say activist journalism? Not you in the okay. in the in in the article they use that term. No, I think you're right. That's another. I would say that's another boundary condition. Yeah, and it's just and that was one of the things I was going to say is there's there's no journalistic standard, right? We talked about the softening of journalistic standards before, yes. and in here it's just completely gone because the everyday person has no uh, ethic or you know whatever. They're they're not bound to some sort of industry standard. It's just right. whoever out there publishing whatever they are experiencing so it you're getting that side of it but you're really only getting that side of it from that event 
Right. It's important because it is a part of the softening of journalism, which is the weakening of journalistic standards of, of an agreed upon set of best practices and things like that, that does still inform at least most print journalism, if not television. Um, and um, that's kind of, I mean, when you're not trained in that, you won't know what those best practices are. And all you're, and you're in the moment, and it's, I don't know how many of you have ever been in the middle of a demonstration or something, but there's a lot of adrenaline there. And it's very, very hard to cover that objectively unless you are trained to do so, okay? Um, and instead, what you tend to do is become like a participant observer, okay? And, and you, are, you are often, you, just by the decisions as to where you turn your camera and what you capture and when you make the camera stop or anything else, those are subjective editorial decisions that everyone makes but they can undermine um, the integrity of what you're doing as journalism because you're advocating, whether you mean to or not. Yeah, go ahead, Dallas. I'm sorry. I think I interrupted you. Oh, no, you're okay. Um, I was just going to say on your last point about um, like the social, like the impact of social media on the move, the actual movements is that it kind of reminds me of like the online petition article also in that people like it's very easy to just go online and do like, a hashtag like saying that you're supporting a movement it's a lot harder to actually go out and do it and a lot of times people don't even know where to get started and they can want to support it if they want but if there's not any like any online presence that's like telling people like about like where demonstrations will be or what the next steps to support the cause I feel like most people aren't going to do that on their own they have to kind of be like led towards that yeah, that's a solid observation, and it's the kind of thing that's easy to forget because not only are there then no um, standardized best practices for journalism, but even as activists, I mean, there you know, there are ways of, of mobilizing people that have you know there are manuals and how to do it and things like that um, that people, longtime activists have written and 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 thought about a lot, and if you're not informed by those and disciplined by those and guided by those, and you're also not guided by journalistic best practices the way Brett was talking about, okay, then it's just you out there, you know, and you might catch an interesting image. You might just as well put up nothing but garbage, um, or you might, the stuff that you post might be so confusing um, that no one can tell, I mean, well, you know, because what are we always doing? Who's the good guys? Who's the bad? I actually had an adult ask me today with respect to Yemen, who are the good guys? And I'm like, what are you, nine? <laughs> you know, first of all, that's not the point. Famine's not about good guys and bad guys. Um, but see, that's the problem with public journalism, that so-called, or, or activist journalism, as Brett, I think, rightly disparaged it, is you're, you're neither fish nor fowl. You're not really an activist. If you're trying to be journalistic and objective about something, you can't be an activist, really, not very effectively. If you're trying to be a journalist, but you're trying to support a cause, then you're acting as an activist. It's, this gets back a little bit to the Hunter Thompson notion of you know, the participant observer a little bit. That participant observer challenge is, is, is what makes this so-called public journalism interesting. It's also what limits it. It's also a boundary condition. And if it's not informed, then the points that Dallas is raising about can you really mobilize people, if you don't know what you're doing, no, you might just as well turn people off. Is anything else so that's a good point um, well and also oh sorry no go ahead I, i'm just i'm resetting my article here go ahead i just dribbled. um with social media it's also like there's all the algorithms and um like guidelines behind it to where it makes it difficult to like always reach as wide of an audience as you'd like because people a lot of times are getting shown like on their timelines or whatever stuff they're already somewhat interested in or have looked at in the past so you're really seeing like besides like your followers the only other people that are really gonna see it are ones that are already looking into those movements instead of reading reaching like a wide demographic and that makes it tough and social media sites themselves can kind of like you know decide like who sees what or like in the case of china how they were saying that like there's the great like firewall which like doesn't allow them to like post to social media and stuff like that mm -hmm. There's another, um, 
area that's there's a limited literature on this that's pretty good. This is just touched on on page six in terms of the augmentation of traditional journalism. What, when social media first started to develop and particularly when cell phones with cameras started to proliferate in the, in the so-called developing world, there was a great optimism about the, the potential to exert democratizing pressure on authoritarian regimes in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, but one of the cases here that's mentioned is um, Kiperogi's uh, uh, 2016 study of Nigeria. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of social unrest and violence in Nigeria. It's, it's really, really not, a, it's very seldom that Nigeria has been stable or safe ever. And that's quite unfortunate. But there were, in other words, there's sort of two things here. One of which was, well, we've got these people now who are um, this sort of alternative journalism. One of the concerns is a lot of it is what they refer to as just um, social media chatter, you know, that we use, there's a certain vernacular that's in the use of hashtags and stuff like that, that isn't very precise and doesn't provide much explanatory power or anything. So that informative element that we rely on for journalism may not be there. Yeah, you know, you might be right there on scene and you might have first person accounts of something, you might uh, be reporting, you might have still imagery, you might have video or you might have audio. But if there's no context within which to place it, which good journalism will do, it's just it becomes chatter, okay. And, and um, so one of the one of the alternatives to that they mentioned is that um, let's see how does he say it's, it says it better than I do. He also suggests that traditional media can complement or contain the luxuriance and exuberance of the social media scene so that you have that raw power coming out of the you know the social media coverage and then the per, the trained journalist can follow that oh there must be a story there somewhere there's lots of chatter can follow that chatter go in there observe it professionally and more, somewhat more dispassionately negating perhaps the um, you know the sort of activist dilemma that Brett talked about and then you can enhance the quality of existing journalism especially in a country like Nigeria uh, that tends to have very sort of pro-administration corporate media uh, that, that dominate things because it always has been such a repressive country. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, anything, this is a fairly densely written article. There's a lot in it. Um, and so it, it's gonna take you more than one read to get into this, but they, they have a lot to say. And I think it's a valuable study so I would encourage you to kind of ease through that maybe in a couple of sessions. It, it's also the kind of thing that sometimes is good to try to talk with someone else about when you think you're learning the material, because this is not simple. It's just not as simple as what we think that it's all good news and optimism and we're democratizing media and all that. It's much more complicated than that, okay? Anything else? One second, Monica, first of all, either from either, um, from either uh, Georgia or Dallas, was there anything else that you wanted to say? Or have I completely stepped on you? If I have, I apologize. I, I just was concerned that this is not an accessible article. It's a little hard to open up. And, and so I understand that going in. Okay, I'm sorry, Monica, you had either a question or a comment. Uh, I was just connecting this with something that is kind of common theme of a lot of communications courses that um, the difference between high context culture and low context culture. Mm -hmm. And to me, online social media news is much more of a high context culture in that sense. And that's kind of what you were touching on with the issues with getting it to other countries that don't necessarily have the context to it, that just seeing it on its own, it's not necessarily, it's not self-explanatory. You need a lot of context to be able to um, understand it, both in terms of the content of whatever it is and in terms of how it's presented like with hashtags and abbreviations and things mm -hmm. um, whereas traditional news is more low context and so that can be translated to a lot of different situations because you have more um, background encased within the news itself right yeah and that that is derived logic from communications theory um i i think too this article does connect to a certain extent with the earlier articles that you know that we've looked at, but also clearly with the, um, the problem with Facebook in terms of um, disinformation and misinformation, um, 
even if you are in good faith trying to tell the correct story or whatever, you're dealing with two different kinds of um, inefficiency. One of them is, is the contextual issue that Monica raised, right? I mean, if, if you don't understand the context very well or you aren't trained in how to contextualize what you're showing people, it just becomes, again, it's that idea that it risks becoming internet chatter, okay? But another part of that might well be that you also run the risk of, however, inadvertently misinforming people. Um, this happened a lot with demonstrations in Portland and Seattle and play, I think particularly with Portland, um, where you, if you listen to Fox News, you would have thought that the city of Portland was burning and it wasn't. And I know, cause I was there, um, you know, more than once, cause I know people there and you, you know, I, I just had to get out of the house, you know? Um, so I was, I mean, cause I also, I just wanted to see, you know, what am I, what am I seeing? Um, you know, see so a mask up and you go out there and all that. Um, and what I saw there looked very different from what I was seeing on the news um, because there was context to it. And I understand, you know, for example, very seldom in the contextual coverage, you know, of Portland was that ever, did anyone ever bother to mention how frequently the Portland Police Department has been under federal scrutiny, okay? It, almost constantly for the last, from, from much of my adult life, the Portland police have been under some sort of regime of scrutiny um, by the federal government, by the Justice Department for, for things they've done that are clearly wrong. Um, and again, you know, that's a, an important component of context without which those disconnected shots of burning buildings or, you know, people looking all violent and throwing stuff make no sense at all. And of course, most of them were at night because that's more dramatic footage. Uh, and also we know just the history of American urban demonstrations is that everything gets funky after dark, all right? Because people think they can get away with more. And that's where the opportunists will come out, the looters, the people like that will come out more at night. You know, that's the, those are the times when, for example, you were more likely to see people describing themselves as Antifa would come out at night. It happened in Seattle too, you know, at the end of the 90s. And so that notion of context is one that's normally addressed by professional standards and practices, best practices. But if, you know, with all the best intentions in the world, you can go out there and say, well, I'm going to find out what's really going on in Seattle or Portland or wherever. If you don't understand what you're walking into, we have no idea what you're really giving us. Okay, does that make sense? So is there utility or value to it as content? Yes, of course there is. Can it mobilize people? It's possible. But what the authors here are suggesting is something that in various ways, both Georgia and Dallas were telling us, which is this is not journalism in the accepted sense of, of, of the word. That doesn't mean it's without value, but it means it's, we're still figuring out what its utility is and what its effects are. You know, the whole, Monica mentioned communications theory, and the whole component of communications theory dealing with media effects is kind of being turned inside out right now by the proliferation of this kind of so-called public journalism or, you know, face, you know, internet chatter or whatever you want to call it. So this is something that we, we need to keep an eye on. Um, how many of you who tried to get into this found the article to be accessible and how many of you found it to be difficult? Let me, let me give you, get just a little bit. I've got to decide whether or not to keep this article because the content's valuable, but it is a little bit dry and it might be a little inaccessible. What do you think? I found it took a little bit of work to get into in the first place, like the first couple pages. But then once I kind of broke through that wall, it was pretty easy for me to just sit down and bang out the rest of it. Okay. Um, but it like there was definitely a little bit of a barrier at the beginning. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, Renee. I was gonna say uh, just kind of the same thing as uh, the other two did, where it's it's difficult at first, where you get through like this big chunk of like. Ugh, and then you can kind of understand it as uh, as you read, but you just got to sit down and like make yourself do it. Well, part of the problem is that's true of any scholarly writing for a variety of reasons. One, it's long form, you know, and, and long form is not is automatically inaccessible. But also, 
because it's within a scholarly profession, there's going to be a certain use of terminology that if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with, can be very off-putting. It becomes very technical and that can be distancing. So, um, you know, that's, that's another issue in terms of how to teach these days is the use of scholarly media has become increasingly problematic in the classes I teach. It used to be the easiest thing in the world for me to, you know, put together um, readings that you don't have to pay for because wherever I can avoid that, which is almost all the time, um, never mind copyright laws. You know, I try to give you things to read that are that are substantive and and can fill in the gaps of a single very expensive textbook. It used to be easier to do because students were more prepared to understand that terminology and to read long form. That becomes a little more difficult every year because of the changing nature of how media are, are used by different generations and the increasing use of short form rather than long form, um, you know, presentations of any kind, scholarly, journalistic, whatever. Anything else on that? I'm, I'm interested in your feedback. So if there are articles that you came across, you think, you know what, if I were you, I'd lose this one. I, I take that very seriously. I'm not saying because one of you says this is crap, I'm going to get rid of it. But, you know, when I start hearing pretty consistently, hey, I made an effort, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I start looking around for another source. All right. Um, first, oh, sorry. Yeah, Personally, go ahead. I felt that um, the beginning of the article, like you said, the abstract and leading into it was just packed with a lot of information. So it did take a minute to kind of get locked in on it. But once it went into more of a breakdown of specific incidences and like ways that social media interacted, it became like more clear to me. Oddly enough, because it's at that point that it starts to read almost more like journalism. They're just trying to get the story right. Um, and, and that narrative is one we're more familiar with. And, you know, if you, if you, unless you are see, you know, a graduate student or something like that, this kind of presentation isn't going to be as familiar to you. And, and that, again, that's more apparent with every year that passes. Okay. But I think in terms of the presentation, it seems to me that both of you really got the, the important stuff. So that I thought that was quite good. All right, we got one more, and then and then I, I can let you go, you know, and you could just like get on with your lives and being wonderful. <laughs> um, online petitions, you might think, oh, gee, there's a page turner. Tell me more, Bill. But this <laughs> has become uh, increasingly relevant for political mobilization, and it often is targeted at people who are in the, in terms of their profession or their voting patterns, or if they're registered as Democrats or registered as Republicans, you're going to start getting these emails. I get these things all the time, trying to get me to sign petitions. So tell me about, uh, you know, either Sarah or, or Julian, tell me, tell me all I need to know about online petitions um, and, and, and what they mean for us as new media. Do you want me to go first, Julian? Um, sure. I did want to mention, though, that I think the conversation about, um, like, this activism dilemma is a really good segue. Yeah, well, that's I think what that's I what Dallas was trying to suggest earlier. That, that was kind of his comment. I, he was right. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that connection. Um, so, yeah, I chose this heavily in-depth article. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, because I have participated in like you were saying, uh, in these petitions, and I was curious as to what actually would happen and actually if my voice mattered. So, um, yeah, I mean, everybody knows, I'm assuming, what a petition is <laughs> um, and the purpose of it, you know, to request to do something, usually addressed to a government official or public entity. Um, and they've been around forever. Uh, I can remember going with my mother to the post office when I was young and being with her and people standing out there and asking for handwritten sign, of course. You no, know, I feel really old because well, it's like, I, yeah, no shit. I was like 20, <laughs> you were probably like five. <laughs> Damn it. Sure, I'll yeah. go with that. <laughs> so in yeah, the, yeah, that's right. It used to be that people would, I mean, you occasionally would see that in Ashland because there were so many old people here where they'd be standing right. up and like tabling with a petition. You'll still kind of see that. Yeah, actually I saw that. I was down in LA last year and 
for their, they were trying for a marijuana dispensary. They actually had people out there signing, which I thought was kind of entertaining. Anyway, so um, yes, once you sign a petition, um, it's more than just putting your name on something and hoping something happens. What they're hoping for is to gauge what your interests are. Um, if you say, you know, I signed a petition and they would use, you know, my interest, whatever I'm signing for basically, um, and add me. So I get contacted constantly whenever um, there's any kind of activist movement pertaining to whatever I signed, right? Um, so they've, one of the biggest ones and most recent is um, regarding George Floyd. They talk about that in the article, gathered more than 18 million signatures. Um, and this was kind of in the beginning, these stats. Um, it was the most signed petition on change.org, but of course not the only one. Um, people have signed thousands for Breonna Taylor, um, some others showing support for renaming the city of Columbus, Ohio. Um, so, you know, my question was, is it really going anywhere? Um, but come to find out, yes, a lot of times, even if once you sign your name and it gathers a lot of interest and it really can make a, a difference in putting pressure on different companies, different um, institutions. So there is that, but it's also just about um, gathering activists um, regarding a certain topic. Um, so yes, it's, and I think that yeah, people think that they're not participating, but once they do, and also what it points out is that people don't like to commit to heavy commitments um, that's really in-depth. So something simple as signing a petition and then maybe engaging that person who signed the position, petition with, um, you know, making phone calls, then, then you get more engaged and then you might participate in an actual um, event. So um, anyway, I don't want to talk about everything, Julian, do you? Let me, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prompt Julian because this okay. is a question that beats like a hammer in my brain, as Sherlock Holmes said. What's, what is slacktivism? Tell me yeah, about sorry. slacktivism. That's sort of the other side of this. Yes. That's what I was going to start with, actually. Oh, excellent. Um, See? This idea of professional. <laughs> because um, the question with online petitions is, do they do anything? Is it really just sign your name to something and then forgetting about it? Um, it's what the article author describes is that um, petitions are a low risk, um, accessible first step to people who might be interested in showing their support for a cause, but don't have the time or don't want to make the commitment, like Sarah was saying, to um, involving themselves in direct action. Um, and they identify this, uh, uh, sorry, concept of passive allies. Um, and that's, that's just describing the person that I just described, the person who isn't really sure if they're willing to make all of the time commitments and but it allows uh, the people who run the petitions, the organizers, to uh, identify who those people might be. And then um, so, sort of as Sarah was saying, to send them updates and offers on other ways that they might um, slowly be encouraged to commit to direct action, such as making phone calls or tabling. Um, and so something that reminds me of that is sort of like when Osberg here, uh, so you used to table in the in the hawk and they'd have you sign the petition and then they'd check boxes on like, are you interested in participating? Are you willing to come to our first meeting just to see what's going on? And then the first meeting actually is organizing committees. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the um, slacktivism part. Um, they also mentioned a concept of a theory of change. And I guess I should mention that the, the most important thing in this article, the thing that sort of 
the author wanted to get across is in the title that online petitions work best when you do more than sign and this article is sort of a helping like guide to how that can be achieved in some parts and they mentioned that it's better to have your um the premise of your uh petition sorry <laughs> i'm losing my train of thought um explaining how sort of mass public pressure has worked in the past and how um, things like this have worked before and using things like um, emotional anecdotes to engage people with uh, either outrage or sympathy so that they'll be more likely to sign, share, donate, or learn more about the issue. Um, in any cases, or in any of those cases, it's uh, helpful to the cause. And uh, that by doing that, you can engage um, not only the legislators that you might be trying to pressure, but also um, influential you know, companies or, or groups that might help you know, take up the mantle and um, assist in exerting that pressure. If, if you had to, and this is almost unfair, but we're almost done, so I can almost be unfair. Um, but if you had to kind of draw a conclusion here and you know, somebody were, had asked you, well, you just did this presentation and you read this article on online petitions, are they, are they effective or not? What would you say? Uh, I'd say on their own, no. But usually okay. they're grouped with other issues or other um, actions that can aid in their uh, success. And it does mention even in the article that success and effectiveness in that regard is hard to measure. Sir, what do you think? I did, yeah, and I what I I was just reviewing the article again, and it that it's very likely to influence where you spend your money in the future, how you vote, how to influence, how you influence your friends. So, yes, I think in that respect, you know, kind of like Julian was saying, um, yes, overall it's more effective in that manner. But sometimes it is effective as a petition, but overall probably more not. And um. Yeah, it's more in engaging people. I think one of the things that Americans typically overlook or forget if they once knew it is that petitioning is mentioned specifically in the Bill of Rights. The right to petition the government for redress of grievance. That's what this is. Okay, this is a const an explicitly constitutionally protected right to encourage people to participate through normal institutional channels to take people's um, disaffection or their interest of any kind and allow them to be aggregated in this way through this medium, the petition, so that government can have some sort of mechanism of feedback. What do the people think about this? And petitions are supposed to do that. And the, the theory is, and this is sort of small L liberalism coming out of you know, the, the, the enlightenment is the idea that however much you may have actual participation in terms of who's making decisions, it is an indispensable component of a republic that people must be allowed to respond to what the government is doing. So the government can kind of do that, how's my driving? you know, and, and all that. And that's the purpose of these. And so, you know, one thing to think about is where, you know, and this is not clear from this article, because remember, this is a journalism, this is not a scholarly article, but one of the things I would want to know, in you know, I kind of do know, is what happens, what happens to the information? Where, where, you know, what do you do with these data? Where do they go? Does any of this ever get to the people who are the source of the grievance, you know. So you want to change, you know, the name of Columbus, Ohio, because you don't like Columbus or something like that. Where does it go? Does it go to the, you know, the city? I think 
Columbus has a city council. Does it go to the city council? I mean, does it go to the mayor? Does it, where does it go? What happens to it? And one of the things that bothers me a little bit about this is that the strongest advocates of petitioning are people who host petitioning websites or who do a lot of petitioning. Well, yeah. I mean, if they tell, they're not going to tell you, well, you know, this thing that I do, it's really worthless, but I kind of found a way to monetize it, or I kind of found a, it's useful for me to gather demographic information and put together emailing lists and stuff like that, which, by the way, is a lot of what happens here. It's people, it's, it's old school politics using new media. It used to be, and this is where I really am showing my age, but I remember the first couple of times I met people who were campaign professionals. And the big thing then was to have what was called a Rolodex, okay? And it was this circular like file thing that had these little cards that you could pull out, right? And they had a name and they had a, you know, an, a phone number and sometimes in a mailing address. And there would be other information, like maybe if you knew how they voted or if, if they were a union member or whatever they were, you know, usually leadership positions, right? Because in that Rolodex were the people you were going to need to talk to because they were going to be your surrogates and your persuaders in the upcoming campaign. But in addition to that, and the, the Republicans really first figured this out quite brilliantly, and they took it from marketing of all things. Um, and they took it from what a lot of televangelists were doing too. They had mailing lists and mailing lists became the, the gold standard of grassroots operations. You would have these mailing lists and they would cost now, this, we're talking about back in the 70s, they might cost tens of thousands of dollars for you to get a hold of, right? But they were gold because they had these people to whom you could send targeted mailings because you knew these people uh, responded to a phone call from us or they responded to a mailing from us. And so we have all their information. Well, this is part of what these petitioners aren't telling you is that you're, it's, like, it's like using Facebook. Facebook doesn't survive because it believes in democracy. It survives because it's selling your information to people for commercial purposes, okay? And these do the same thing. I don't mean to denigrate them when I say that, but it is an important part of our, we have to remember, particularly in the United States, if it isn't about money, it's not about anything. And ultimately, it's got to be at least in part about who's going to donate to us. Let's look at who signed petitions. And the next thing you know, you're going to get a targeted email saying, you know, we can do thus and such, but we, if you could, you know, they have a list of possible contributions and things like that. Um, you're going to, you'll notice magically, those will come out of the internet ether at you because somebody's collecting these data and they're probably selling these data. Okay. I, again, I don't, I don't think it's not some scary conspiracy carried out by, you know, lizard people who exhale cold air or whatever. I mean, it's, this is the way politics is done at the retail level. It's like knocking on doors, except you don't have to. Does that make, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It would make more sense if you took um, Sean Patterson's campaigns class, which, which I would recommend. I used to teach that and Sean teaches it probably much better than I do now. But this kind of thing comes up in, in campaign strategies. One of the things I used to have people do in the campaigns class was to put together a proposal for running a campaign or study a campaign. Sometimes I'd, they'd make an individual campaign a case study and the really diligent students would find out things like, oh yeah, they're doing this petitioning or they're doing you know these mailings or whatever. That's a lot of what this is. Yeah. All right, anything else on this? That was, that was, that was good. I like that, it was quite good. Any other questions on any of these readings? Or are there any questions on the last assignment? The, again, the, the prompt is up there, invisible. Um, it's pretty much, remember, please, I'm gonna ask you one more time, and, but this should be something you do in every bit of scholarly writing, every bit of academic writing you do. Every time, every single time that you make an assertion, cite your source. Okay, um, because you're showing me you know how to apply literature. It's one of the things that we measure in assessment for the program, okay, is how well do our students make use, make proper use of information and how, how well do they cite it and, uh, and all that. It's part of sort of the literacy component of research is, you know, 
what do you do with the information when you get the information, okay? Um, one of the things I mentioned in the prompt to think about, right? Well, many people get their news, in quotes, from the internet. Don't ever say that, by the way. When I ask you where you got that, don't ever say the internet, because as you, I think you can see after 10 weeks of this stuff, that means nothing. That doesn't help us at all. The sources are often traditional rather than new. That is, a lot of what you're getting online, might, the original source of that might well have been the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or CNN. If you notice that a couple of these things I showed you, the source was CNN. The source was not the internet. Okay, so it was part of a regular established news organization. Okay, when you're looking at information and trying to assess its validity because you want to avoid disinformation, look at what the sources are. How often are they forthcoming about what their sources are? And do you check their sources? You know, if you don't, that's okay. I mean, you know, you, you have a right to your own ignorance, but you are much more easily deceived when you are not approaching information with a certain amount of skepticism. You know, prove to me that your claims are accurate. It should always be somewhere in the middle of your mind, okay? Anything else? Any other uh, questions or concerns? Again, the deadline for this is about as late as I can do it. It's Thursday, the 18th of March at 11 o'clock, right? Please no late assignments because I really want to be able to take some time over the weekend um, and take some time to grade these and um, make sure that everyone gets as fair as possible uh, a concluding evaluation. Okay, let's see. Just for the people who didn't present. That's right. Yeah, if you presented, yeah, you're, you know, you're off the hook, man. <laughs> you know? If you've done your two written materials and you've done your two presentations, and, and one of the last ones was today, what you now have done is all you're going to do. There is no final. Finals are Satan's joke, um, whatever. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think finals have any utility here any more than I did in graduate school, where you know, I once had a philosophy class um, that actually had a final because it was, it was taught to upper division undergraduates and graduate students. And, and because we had been out kind of making merry the night before, I just kind of like slept right into the middle of it. And then I rolled in and I couldn't face it. And so I told the professor who already hated my guts, I can't face this and left. And you know, you don't want to fail classes at the graduate level. But on the other hand, I had a fabulous gig the night before and uh, it was wonderful. So the hell with a graduate school, who cares? Anyway, they gave me a PhD just to get rid of me. And so here I am. Anything else? Okay, um, my sense of this, I don't know what yours is. Uh, the, I liked the way the class went in the main. I, I got some really, I've got a lot of good notes on uh, people's comments. A lot of, I noticed this today too, a lot of really thoughtful observations that were connecting readings together. That's more common toward the end of the class. I want to remind you um, that the, um, oh, what is it called? Whatever it's called, I can't remember. The, um, the survey that they use by way of evaluating classes, those I think are available now. Um, and I, I do not get access to any of that information until after grades are submitted. So your anonymity is protected from me, if you're worried about that. But um, when we do evaluations of classes, those are really important. Um, student evaluations are a very important component of the tenure and promotion track for faculty, but also when we come up for evaluation within our programs, the first thing they pull out is the class evaluations. And there's always valuable information there. I'm particularly interested, not so much in whether or not you like me personally, because that's not why I'm here. But as I say, if the literature, if some of it didn't work and you can explain why, that's really helpful. Um, if there's something, a subject matter, for example, that you would like to have seen covered in more depth here or that you felt I spent too much time on, that's really constructive criticism. None of which, by the way, I ever take personally, because there's always a better way to do this stuff. And I. I like the idea that there are two things that I do better now than I did when I was 30. One of them is play guitar. The other one is teach. And the only reason I'm better at both of those is because I'm willing to let people tell me what I'm doing that could be better. You know, so I, I really, uh, I never take it personally and I always think it's important. Okay. Other than that, any other um, questions, comments, anything like that? I know it's been a strange term. Winter term always is, but winter term in a time of COVID, probably stranger. So I think in that sense, most of you did a really stand-up job and, you know, you showed up, um, you 
generally speaking, had read the, you know, read the material and were comfortable with it. You know, so I was, I was pretty satisfied with the way the class went, especially since so many of you are not political science majors. And so some of this covered, or communications majors. Um, so some of this material is really brand new to you. And yet I, I, I was really, um, I was thinking about before class today, I was talking to this colleague of mine who asked me who the good guys were. And I was telling her that I thought this was a, a really good group of people who I wish I could keep in the major kind of thing. That would be really fun. But anyway, I get selfish. All right, uh, if there's nothing else, then um, um, pace yourself through your finals. Get this, you got plenty of time to get this thing in on time. Other than that, I think you got two weeks break. Enjoy it, decompress, get this stuff out of your head, clear out the cobwebs with a couple of beers or you know whatever works best for you. And uh, hopefully I will see some of you um, next term. Um, could still use a couple of more people in the 371 class if you're curious. That's gonna be an interesting class. We're doing a, it's sort of philosophy of violence. And um, yeah, we still have some, some open seats in that class. And there are a couple of you who I can tell just by way, the way you approach this class would do well there. So something to think about. If you're curious about it, I can send you the syllabus um, such as it is. Other than that, have a good break and I hope to see some of you next term. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>